Looking to take your mobile phone videos to the next level? Feel like the out-of-the-box camera is limiting your creativity? Well, let's dive into the world of the Blackmagic Cam Mobile together. We will cover all on-screen elements such as lens settings, ISO, white balance, histogram, several levels of in-device stabilization, adjustments and much more. Simply to create more cinematic look to your films. And the best part, this powerful app is available for free for your iPhone in the App Store. Let's dive into it. For those who already know me, welcome back to my channel. For everyone else, thank you for dropping by. I'm Christian and I'm a camera and tech nerd and if you like what you see, simply like and subscribe. Thanks. Alright, enough with this small talk, I know why you're here. The Black Magic Cam for your mobile phone. Quick heads up, this video isn't sponsored, no one paid or gifted anything for it. I'm here to demonstrate what you can do with this free app. Like many of you, I wanted to level up my mobile videos and control at least some of these exposure settings myself. If you want to know more about setting up your camera, check out my video where I show how to manually adjust yours for great photos and videos without any constraints. But you know what? You've always got a powerful camera right in your pocket. These days mobile phones are little powerhouses and they are now a real alternative for on-the-go shots. To improve the quality of them even more, I recently stumbled upon this app and unexpectedly it's developed by the same company that offers DaVinci Resolve, a powerful video editing software from Blackmagic Design, the company renowned for its Blackmagic cinema cameras. Interestingly, DaVinci Resolve is the editing software I currently use for all of my video projects. Anyways, I tried it out and what should I say, after installing the app via the App Store, I took a detailed look at it, made some videos and found that it truly offers many possibilities. What I'm just used to have on my mirrorless camera, honestly. And what those are, I will now show you. For that, let's position my phone here on a spot where I can demonstrate all the features the best. After opening the app, the first thing to do is to grant some camera phone permissions. I will accept all of them right now. Done. Now we are jumping directly into the user interface of the camera app. To match the winter vibes here in Austria, I've got a special guest, Mr. Cambert and his snowy bird box. Before we go menu by menu, let's talk about focus and auto exposure. It's simple, just like your regular camera app, tap to focus and auto exposure, AE, AF, and simply hold to lock it. Press it again to unlock it. The camera app will choose the autofocus and exposure again properly based on the persons or items in the frame. Good. Up in the top left corner we've got lens selection. Default is standard but depending on your phone you can choose wide angle, standard, zoom or front camera. Now the frames per seconds FPS. I've covered this in detail in my DaVinci Resolve tutorial. But in a nutshell, it's how many pictures you're recording per second, 24, 25 and 30 FPS, give a cinematic look. Higher frame rates like 50, 60, 100 or 120 create a unique style or are perfect for slow motion. Simple, right? Let's keep going. Let's talk about shutter speed. Generally, it's recommended to follow the 180 degree rule, which means your shutter speed should be double your frame rate. For example, if your frame rate is for instance 25 FPS, the shutter speed is set to 1 over 50. You can also use 30 FPS as I do right now with 1 over 50 as well to avoid light flickering. The challenges arises when it's too bright outside and the image becomes overexposed because too much light enters the lens. Here you have a couple of options. You can use a mobile ND filter which darkens the picture like sunglasses for your camera. If you want to know more, I've also created a video about that. Alternatively, you can increase the shutter speed as I'm demonstrating right here. The downside of this, and it's why smartphone videos can sometimes look a bit off, is that you lose motion blur and your footage might become a bit jerky. Alright, here in the studio I've adjusted the lighting and I go with 30 FPS and 1 over 50 shutter speed. Moving on to the next item. Iris, also known as lens aperture. As you can see, it's grayed out because the aperture marked as f1.6 is fixed on this lens. 
When you switch to another lens, it uses the aperture of that lens. Essentially, this value shows us how much light can enter the lens. The lower the number, the more light can enter, resulting also in more background blur. Now those numbers in the middle are just our record counter broken down to milliseconds. Right next to it is the ISO value. This value also influences the brightness of the image. In short, the higher the ISO value, the brighter the image. The downside, it can get grainy. I've already published a video on this if you want to dive deeper into the ISO world. Ideally, we want to record with ISO 100 or even lower. However, in some dark situations, it's unavoidable to use higher ISO to get a brighter image. Before you can see anything, you might opt for a slightly lower quality image. What are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments below. All right, we've got two more to cover in the top menu. WB and Tint, both influencing the color of your video image. WB stands for white balance and here you will find various presets for specific situations like sunny, cloudy or artificial light. You can also go with auto, letting the camera choose the white balance for you. However, it's often practical to pre-select it based on your situation. For example, at midday in daylight you can go with 5600 Kelvin manually or simply select the sun preset. It's really a matter of personal preference, but remember it's not as easy to change this in post as it might be with photos shoot in raw format. Now tint is an even finer adjustment when you want to boost or lower your colors even more. I usually leave it at zero because honestly I think it adds a bit more of an artistic touch to the clip. Oh, and there is an indicator to show the resolution the video is being recorded in. We have chosen 4K in the settings, as you can see right here. Let's stick to the main screen. Down below you will see the histogram that I've added. It shows whether your image is properly exposed, underexposed or overexposed. Ideally, make sure the waves are roughly in the middle. If they are too far to the left, the image is too dark. And if they are too far to the right, the image is too bright. It's a good indicator, but your eyes are still the best judge. In the bottom center, you can see your available or used storage space and the approximate minutes you can still record with the current settings before running out of space. Lastly, on the right, there are two bars showing the sound level. If the sound goes up about two thirds of the way around the minus six value, your audio should be loud enough without distortion. Keep that in mind and keep an eye on it, otherwise it could be too silent or it clips with unpleasant noises. Did I miss anything here? I don't think so. Let's move on to the bigger menu items on the right side. Where you find right in the middle the record button and of course the stop button. Pretty self-explanatory I think. Now the first item with the box in a box icon contains more functions. The first one is called Zebras, and no, no Zebras were harmed during this video. It's named like this because when you activate it, the part of the picture that are too bright will be highlighted as Zebra Stripes. I won't get too deep into detail here, you can keep it at 85%, and this percentage relates to various criteria like skin tones for example. Generally, I rely most of the time on the histogram and my eyes, but this can be an additional help for exposing your video properly. The second one with the person inside the box is similar to Zebra's, but this time it helps you to find if the right things are in focus. The more it flicker, the more it is out of focus. You can adjust your focus by checking it peaking here in this percentage scale. The next one is a box with a grid in it, and that's exactly what it's all about. I've already activated my favorite one because it helps you shoot with the rule of thirds. Briefly, it's a compositional guideline in photography and videography suggesting dividing your frame into nine equal parts with two horizontal and two vertical lines. This involves placing key elements along these lines or at their intersections for a visual pleasing and balanced composition like positioning my subject right here on the left vertical line in the foreground. You can also add the cross so that you know exactly where the middle is and some other useful orientation graphics. The next options add transparent bars to your video, allowing better adjustments in post if needed. It serves as good orientation. 
I personally deactivate it since I don't use it often. The following option does a similar thing by placing a transparent box over your picture, though I never used it. The false colors feature, don't confused by missed colors, is meant to help identify un- or overexposed parts of your picture as well. It can be a helpful tool in certain situations, especially when there are a lot of different light sources in the shot. Finally, in this menu there is the LUT lookup table. You can use predefined LUTs, color schemes or templates when shooting in a flat picture format like on professional cinema cameras like the Sony FX3 or so when your phone supports it. Since we are shooting a standard profile it doesn't make sense to use another color profile on top of it as you can see right now. Let's switch back and let's go up again to the second menu item, the box with the A. Here you can switch between autofocus and manual focus. Using the manual focus can be very handy when you want to switch between objects or do some transitions where you want to control the focus by yourself. The next item is adjusting the brightness aka the exposure correction like it is available on your big camera. You can also go from plus 3 to minus 3 to tweak your picture even more. You already mentioned the record button. The symbol under it is the stabilization options. Here you can choose off, standard, cinematic and extreme. Off should be used when you are on a tripod. Standard and cinematic are the most commonly used modes and extreme is the best one but it requires more light. It is comparable to the stabilization of an action cam I would say, which you can test by moving your phone around and noticing a slight delay. The more intensive the stabilizer is, the more delay you'll experience when moving the camera. This adds a more cinematic touch to your footage because it stops smoothly, not immediately. Moving on to the next menu item. The magnifying glass icon allows for manual zooming, but it's mostly a digital zoom affecting your picture quality. The more you zoom, the worse your quality gets. For zooming, it's better to use the available lenses for a more telephoto shot. The last icon is the clapperboard, which adds details and metadata to your shot. If you use the app frequently, it can help you organize your videos better. I really like the visualization resembling an old school slate. It has a nice touch. Now let's briefly look at the right side menu. The first icon represents the currently used camera. And the next one is the media icon where you can find all your recorded footage with various details. You also have the option to log in and see your clips in the Blackmagic cloud if you have an account. In the chat menu item again you need a cloud account. Finally, let's quickly explore the last item in the menu, the gear icon, aka the app settings. Frankly, I was surprised the first time I saw how many options it offers. Well done Blackmagic. While you might not use most settings, some are meaningful, especially when predefining them before you start shooting. However, it depends on your individual level of professionalism. The first menu item is record where you can choose your file formats for recording. Higher quality results in a larger file size. For newer iPhones, Apple ProRes is an option, but HEVC H265 is also sufficient and offers a slightly lower quality. In the resolution item you can choose 4K, 1080p or 720p, in 2023 opting for 4K provides flexibility for reframing or zooming in during post-production. Regarding color space you can record in Rec. 709 in the standard format. This iPhone doesn't support flat profile settings, flagships do, allowing you to apply LUTs. Time display can be set to record run, displaying the count of a recorded time in the app. Time lapse recording is a handy feature, saving memory but capturing a predefined number of pictures to generate a beautiful time lapse. You can set a warning for dropped frames. I keep it on alert to be informed but not interrupt the recording. Moving to the camera menu item, you can enable vertical video and set triggers for records as alerts or flashes. Using the volume button to trigger record is useful, especially in winter when wearing gloves. Locking white balance on record ensures consistent color in your videos. Shutter measurements visualization can be displayed as speed or angle. 
I prefer the former. Adjusting hertz depending on your region helps avoid flickering with different light sources. Lens correction corrects vignetting or lens distortions, I assume. Anamorphic lens settings normalize the picture with preset formats. In the audio section, choose the audio source's internal or external microphone. Keep ACC audio format stereo works well for recording audio in general. The audio metering settings are usually best left as default. Focus assistant and guide settings relate to detailed adjustments. HDMI external monitor options include mirroring and other settings. Display options are straightforward. In the media section you can use predefined settings or adjust to your needs. Choose whether to upload original files, proxies or both. The LUT section allows you to activate display LUT, upload your own LUTs and select presets. Exercise caution when using record LUT to clip as it will instantly override that flat profile with your selected LUT. In the next section you can use external Bluetooth devices with the Blackmagic Cam app and activate or deactivate them via this slider. Finally, there is the option to log into the Blackmagic Cloud to reset your settings and some details about the current installed app versions, as well as a link to learn more about Blackmagic design on their website. Open Blackmagic Cam settings will redirect you to the phone's internal settings for this specific app, where you can change the settings you have already set after installing the app in the very beginning. All right, I think that's all for today. As we wrap up our journey into the world of the Blackmagic Cam app, I hope you've enjoyed the insights shared in this video. If you did, show some love by hitting that like button and subscribing. It truly helps the channel grow. Got questions or want to share your own Blackmagic Cam experiences? The comment section is the place to be. Your thoughts really matter. For more content on cameras, filmmaking and all things creative, Check out the other videos here or here on my channel. I promise there's something for everyone. Thanks for hanging out today. Keep capturing those cinematic moments, stay inspired and I will catch you in the next one. Until then, happy shooting.